November 4, 2018. Grateful for, or grateful from. Neil Worthington, Licensed Unity. Teacher and Spiritual Leader at Unity of Payson, Arizona. I found myself staying in a resort, an Ayurvedic resort for Ayurvedic treatment, uh, on the Indian Ocean in South India. And uh, before long, I found that I became a fixture there. I began to consult a little bit on hospitality and eventually on construction. And uh, soon I was a part of that community and happy to be so. One day I found myself sitting in the uh, dining room with tables pulled together with 12 men. They weren't the disciples, but they were 12 men anyway. Uh, the men were from the surrounding community. The resort was situated on the cliff overlooking the Arabian Sea, and around that was a very poor community. And they had come for the express purpose at the invitation of the owner of the resort to see what can we do to support the development and the growth of our community. So uh, they spoke Malayalam, the language of Kerala. I spoke none of it, and uh, probably most of them, with the exception of the owner, spoke little or no English. So I had uh, the owner to translate for me, and here's how the meeting went. One by one, the men went around and uh, shared their dream for what they could do to enhance their community and, and largely that was that they might prosper just a bit more because it was a very poor community. So it went from uh, one fellow who said, boy if I could just have three or four boogie boards and rent them to the tourists down on the beach, that would create a stream of income that would come back to the community and would develop it. Another one said, boy I've always had the dream of having a little shop. We could sell bottled water, we could sell snacks, and, and things that the uh, tourists and holiday makers, mostly Europeans, uh, would like. Another one said, well, my wife is really good at sewing, and we could have a little sewing business. And another one said, but I'm really good at climbing coconut trees. And so we could get a group of tourists to come. I could climb the coconut trees, lop off the coconuts, fall them to the ground, and then take those and taking the top off, we would sip uh, the, the coconut water. Uh, so all of these ideas came out, and, and they were, uh, they were uh, to me, kind of very interesting because it was somewhat new to me. Um, and then the question was asked by the owner, well, what, if there is one thing that we could do, what could we do to help our community more than anything else? Let's think of the first thing we can do. And almost unanimously, they said, learn English. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> since I was the native English speaker at the table, it soon evolved into the vision of and the creation of a school for English learning. So it didn't take them too long to manifest this dream or manifest the dream and reality, and then eventually. So uh, one of them said, but there's a house across the way that's kind of broken down and there's no roof on it anymore. Uh, we could use that for the schoolhouse. I don't think anybody will mind. Kind of wasn't property like we know it here, but that was agreed upon. Another one said, uh, if, if the resort will help us, we can make a flyer and post it uh, everywhere within 300 yards of this area and see if people are interested in this. And somebody said, well, let's have a meeting and uh, we'll invite the mayor and, and we'll see. So the meeting was set two days hence and we had a meeting inviting everyone to come and learn English. Well, only 100 people turned up. So, uh, but the excitement grew and grew. And in fact, we decided that the next day was the day we would start classes. Now, this is all with me who has no experience as a teacher and not as an, a, an ESL teacher, English is a second language, and not knowing a word of Malayalam. But it was set in the school. They rushed to the market. 
They got a big piece of supply and put in some blackboard paint. All the men of the community got from wherever they could in banana leaves and made a new roof on the uh, failing building. Uh, they swept the floor. No other furniture needed in India. And the school was there. Voila! <laughs> so here's the thing. Almost from nothing, what these Indian men at that point, I'm sorry it was only men, but that's the way it is in India. These men had a dream that infected the rest of the community. And they began to be at a place where they could see it more than they could not see it. They could see this development that they desired to have. They could see the tangible step that would take them there. And so the school began. So what did they do? They developed a consciousness of gratitude. They were just they were just tickled paint to have this school. It went pretty well, by the way, too. Uh, but they were uh, the, the idea is that from within them welled up this desire. From within them welled up this aspiration. Uh, they got into an attitude of gratitude, and that's what we'd like to talk about today. So we're not uh, we're not in South India, but we are here in Payson, and I'd like to have us look at gratitude these two ways, keeping in mind this story from South India. So gratitude can be one of two things, and many more, but we're only going to consider two. There's a month of gratitude here. We've got plenty of time to do some other things. So we're looking at these two ways. It may be a litany or a list of blessings that we've received, or it may be an attitude from which blessings spring. Grateful from is the second, grateful for is the first. And not like the class, Wednesday night class, I gave them a trick question, this or that, and uh, they figured it out pretty quick. So you probably figured it out pretty quick as well. Um, so the first, again, there are things that we've brought into our lives that are we are blessed by. Um, wonderful things, little things that happen, great things, our health, our home, our dreams, our community. Those are blessings that we have every day. Let's take a close look at that first perspective, gratitude for. Remember the first Thanksgiving? The uh, pilgrims got together with the Native Americans and they celebrated in gratitude, thankfulness. They feasted and all. And they were grateful for, one, having that great land. I suspect that it was very beautiful in that New England setting. They celebrated that they had a connection with not only <coughs> the earth itself, but with the native uh, people who lived there and probably owned that land. I'm not sure they acknowledged that. They celebrated that they had food to eat, that they had some kind of housing to help them endure the harsh winters. They were grateful for their blessings. But there's another side to it. They were grateful that the bitter, cold sea, air, and waves that they had endured as they crossed the sea or with them no longer. That the hunger that they at first experienced because they didn't know how to grow or find or hunt for food had ceased. That the hostility maybe that was there was at an end. So not only were they grateful for, but they turned away from the things and we're grateful that these were no longer part of our experience or their experience. Now I think when we are grateful for, we often, uh, first of all, 
forget many of the things for which we could be grateful. After a while, we grow used to the little blessings that we have every day. And so, growing used to them, they become almost as though they're an entitlement, and we uh, kind of forget to be grateful for them. Um, yes, the big things. Uh, the miracles, we're grateful for those. Uh, the big events, the great family reunions, that's what we're grateful for those. But what about those little things every day? Do we lose an awareness of those? So what helps us to keep, number one, being grateful for what we are, and number two, turning from that which we are not grateful for? Because sometimes we spend all of our focus there. I'm going to suggest that it is the practice of gratitude. And I wonder uh, who of you may have a gratitude practice. Do you journal? Do you share with a friend about gratitude? And I'm not talking you know, once in a month. I'm talking about on a daily basis. Do you share with a friend your gratitude? Do you have a, a prayer of gratitude, a time when you just sit and look within and are grateful that your very nature that your very inheritance provides all that you need do you even and this can be done by rote but do you even maybe sit at mealtime and give thanks for your food this is what gratitude for is all about and I suggest that that spiritual practice I I propose will be very helpful to you in uh, maintaining and growing that gratitude. Charles Dickens says, reflect on your pleasant blessings, of which man has plenty, not on your past misfortune, of which all men have some. We look to the wisdom of the past as well. So we're, we're, we're grateful when it's going good, all those things we talked about, all the nice things that happen to us. And we live appreciatively in the present. I mean, notice that phrase, in the present, on the bottom there. And we're not spending a lot of time on this, but we're grateful when it's not going so well. Because in that time, we live faithfully in the present. Both of these are in the present. So now this is a bridge for us as we go on to the next part. I'm going to go back one. Grateful when it's good, living appreciatively in the presence. Graceful when it's not going so well, living faithfully in the present. So now we get to grateful from. Remember those South Indians who had, were somehow able, I suspect they didn't know that they had a consciousness of gratitude, or at least they wouldn't put it in those words, but went from a place of having not much, looking in need, looking in hope, to a place of seeing it, and living from a consciousness of gratitude. Gratitude when we look at, the, look at from this perspective is causative in nature. Not only are we grateful for something, but we're grateful from the place where we are in consciousness. Deepak Chopra had a book uh, that many of you may be familiar with, one of my favorites, The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. One of those laws is the law of giving and receiving. And in that, he said that the whole thing is a cycle, giving and receiving. When we don't interrupt the cycle, it keeps going. This is the truth of the universe, that giving and receiving, that flow of grateful 
uh, events, that flow of grateful energy just keeps going unless we cut it off. And I suspect that we cut it off either individually, sometimes as a community, sometimes as a nation, sometimes as a planet. We've cut off that causative energy that's always there. So the question is, how can we uh, appreciate that causative energy, and how can we appropriate it to ourselves. I have to admit that I am prone sometimes to be outside of that flow, that cycle of the energy of gratitude. So easy for me to focus on who did me wrong, why someone is just so hard to get along with, why it always seems that I'm the one that gets this, What that does is interrupt that very natural cycle of the flow of gratitude. So as I am able to use my spiritual powers, and I'm going to suggest three of them. Anybody notice, notice that 12 powers project that we've got going on there? We'll talk about it later. But anybody familiar, is it... Well, I won't ask if anybody's not familiar, but I'm just going to assume that you all have some little bit of familiarity with the 12 powers of man. These are, Charles said of man, but these are abilities that all of us are given by our very uh, created nature, by our very design, we have these powers available to us. And I'd like to suggest three of them that will help us here in experiencing the consciousness of gratitude or gratitude from First one is release. Wonderful power. So often we hang on to our disappointments, our irritation, our resentfulness, maybe even our unforgiveness. And as we hang on to them, we're staying outside of that flow of gratitude. We're, it's flowing here and we just aren't catching up with it. If it was a merry-go-round, remember those merry-go-rounds on the on the uh, play yard, the school yard. If it was a merry-go-round, the merry-go-round's going around, it's going around too fast, and we're standing there on the side, and there's no way we can get on that merry-go-round. So as we are able to release those things that hold us back, it's not easy. But as we are able to release, as we are able to forgive, as we're able to go beyond that, well, I'll forgive, but I won't forget. As we are, we begin to start to get up to speed where maybe we have a chance of getting on that, uh, that uh, merry-go-round. I'm going to suggest a second power, and that's the power of faith. The power of believing. Now, faith is a funny thing. Faith is a gift from the divine. We have that. But it's also something that has to be Engaged. It's something that has to be developed. It's something that has to be built. So, when we're able to take faith, that little bit we have, uh, like the paralytic, or no, like the man who had a, a, the sick child said, I, uh, uh, yes, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. When we're able to take that faith and build that belief, and, and then we're able to get up more and more up to speed to get onto that, that merry-go-round. How do we build that faith? I think we build that faith by focusing on the truth of what we know, the truth that comes from within us, the truth of the teaching that we have drawn to ourselves. As we connect with that on a very intimate level, we're able to, we're more and more up to speed. So, Number three, how about will? That's a, will is a curious power, too. I can think of willfulness, and sometimes I've been very willful. But will is also a very positive thing in that it is the ability to choose or decide. We have this ability, this great gift to choose or decide. Sometimes we let it go to our subconscious choosing or even our unconscious choosing. But as we're able to 
bring together our spirit and our mind, our heart and our mind, as we're mindful, we're able to choose that which we desire. To know the steps that we need to take and choose that which we desire. Now, now we're almost up to speed. The merry-go-round's going around, and we're. But you know what it is? When we finally jump on that merry-go-round, not only do we get on for the ride, we're actually the cause of that because we provide some very energy that makes that mer that merry-go-round continue to go. So gratitude is a very causative energy. Eric Butterworth uh, shares this in Spiritual Economics, one of the books we're considering in the class. So I invite you to think of both of these things, but how do we do it? Um, kind of tough to say, yeah, all these things are true, but how do we do it? So in both the case of being thankful for and being thankful from, we begin with our own experience. If you don't have something in your experience that you're grateful for, imagine it. It works just as well. Begin with your experience there. And if you're talking about from, grow that faith. How do you do that? And we'll go to the next point. Bathe yourself in truth. What is the truth that comes up for you? What do you just intuitively know? This is right. What do you hear here? What do you read in inspirational readings? Bathe yourself in Milk that truth that you know until you make it just as full as you possibly can for you. Then, uh, a little bit of a challenging one sometimes, monitor your mind. Oh, how powerful we are in mind, and how little we use it. So monitor that mind. Be mindful. Bring into your awareness both the things that you want to put aside and release, and the things that you want to draw to yourself and the faith that you're growing to get there. And then finally, and thank you, Maurice, for your talk about the silence, that time of silence, opening the door into the silence. When we open the door into the silence, and we spend time there, in some way, somehow, you're gifted with the knowing, the inspiration to achieve our desires. So I challenge you, are you grateful for, are you grateful from? That's not either one, it's both. And so it is.